Hi everyone, my name is John Gephard and I am the sales manager for the ISSA show North America and I am so excited to welcome you all to the fourth episode of Preview Week. Today I'm happy to introduce Cascades Pro, the official sponsor for this webinar. Cascades Pro will be exhibiting at our annual trade show next month in Las Vegas, so please be sure to register and visit them in booth W2134. If you enjoy this webinar, be sure to keep an eye out for more that will be available the rest of this week. You'll hear from other speakers from our official show sponsors and exhibitors as they bring you relevant content in the worldwide cleaning industry, all brought to you live and tailored to your business. If you have any questions during this presentation, please submit them in the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen and the presenters will answer them after their presentation concludes. Lastly, this webinar will be recorded and available on ISSAshow.com. So you can watch this on demand if you are unable to stay the entire presentation. I'm now happy to introduce your speakers for this hour, Frederick Perro and Dr. Chuck Gerba. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you all for joining us for our panel today on the importance of hygiene in the COVID-19 era and beyond. If during the session you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask them using the, the chat section. And if we have time at the end, we will address them. If not, we will include these questions and answer in an article that we will write and publish on our website, cascadespro.com, in the next few weeks. Um, well, first, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, some of you may remember me from uh, our panel during ISSA last year, uh, but for those who don't, my name is Frédéric Perrault. I'm the Research and Development Manager at Cascades. I work alongside 45 brilliant scientists, including chemists, microbiologists, and technicians, uh, trying to help and innovate and develop, well, innovative solutions uh, across the three Cascades divisions, which are packaging solutions, hygiene and tissue solutions, and also fiber-based materials. Joining me today is an expert in the field of hygiene and someone we've had the privilege to uh, interact with, entering that with in the past few years, including our panel last year, Dr. Charles Gerber. Dr. Gerba is a professor of immunology, uh, he is a professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Arizona, and he has authored more than 700 journal articles, and he is best known for his work in the environmental germ theory in the household, earning him the nickname Dr. Germ. His work has been impactful globally, for example, his work on the spread of norovirus led to great changes in cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting practices. His study on pathogens on shopping carts, for example, prompted supermarket chains nationwide to adopt the use of wipes for customer use. So his goal is really to reduce the burden of diseases and share insights about techniques that can help stop outbreaks or at least minimize their impact like, for example, hand washing and hand drying. So Dr. Gerba, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and since we were last together a little over a year ago, a tremendous amount has, has changed. And I don't think uh, all, well, a year ago, uh, we would all be there uh, uh, thinking that we would still be dealing with a global pandemic. And having said that, the, the pandemic has certainly changed how we as a, society, as a society view hygiene. And that's not something that will change in the foreseeable future. So in your perspective from a microbiological level, what have we learned over the past year as it relates to hygiene? Yeah, I think we've learned a great deal. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, uh, the turn of the 20th century was called the Great Hygiene Awakening. And I think we 
uh, have had another episode of her awakening again of the importance of hygiene and the control of infectious diseases this last two years has really seen uh, a great interest in hygiene as a way of preventing because I think people realize you don't ha instantly have a vaccine available or an option that you can intervene besides hygiene. And hygiene actually ha has a very large impact in the spread of disease. And what we've learned in the past year a lot is how readily a virus in the modern world can spread, I think is the, the main thing we've seen. In a lot of ways, looking at it uh, as a microbiologist, we have the perfect storm now for a pandemic. Uh, we have the uh, rapid uh, uh, spread and development uh, of the virus because we have uh, greater air, airplanes, cruise ships, buildings, stadiums, and that. We have more people crowded in one space than any before a uh, time in history. And so this creates a storm where we can transmit microorganisms very readily through the environment. And, and so that's what we've seen a lot of, of a better understanding of how rapidly uh, in virus like SARS-CoV-2 can spread in our environment. And it reemphasizes the importance of, uh, I think, hygiene more than ever, because that's our first weapon and our first defense. And um, we're hearing quite a bit about different variants of SARS-CoV-2 that are coming along. Can you tell us a little bit more about these variants? And I think especially about the Delta one that we hear a lot about. Yeah, I, I think one of the things you have to realize that, uh, in a way, uh, microorganisms are, are forever contaminant uh, because they evolve all the time. They change all the time. That's why you have to have an influenza vaccine every year because we're not dealing with the same organism. We see that in SARS-CoV-2 where we're suddenly we, we uh, have a variant, the Delta variant, that spreads more readily uh, in, uh, from one person to another. Why? Well, it, it's believed that you uh, secrete more of the Delta variant than you uh, do of the uh, Alpha variant, which is the original variant. So it's it estimated you uh, secrete when you cough, sneeze 100 times more virus. There's also the possibility that the virus have, may have more sites to attach to your cells and cause infection. I think it creates an awareness uh, that we were continually dealing with these variants and how well they might survive in the environment is one of the things that we're looking at. Does the Delta virus survive longer in the environment uh, than, than the Alpha variant or the original variant? Because uh, we know these viruses can survive for hours to days on surfaces that we commonly touch in that. So that, that's a concern too, where we see variants evolve with different ability to survive in the air on surfaces, ability to be transmitted uh, to your hands when you touch a surface. So all of those things change all the time. The, and, and we have to be aware of that, uh, that, that we're dealing with a microorganism that's going to continually evolve and try to adapt to changes in our habit. And um, uh, we hear different routes of contamination from, from these viruses. And for, for COVID, we've heard that inhalation is, is one of the main uh, routes of contamination. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about the other ways, like uh, since your work is uh, a lot focused on uh, uh, contamination coming from the hands, uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, you know, we believe the primary route by which uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is transmitted is by inhalation, by aerosols when you cough and sneeze. But the, the important thing to realize that's believed to be the primary route, but that doesn't negate uh, the potential transmission by touching surfaces and bringing your fingers to your nose, my mouth, or eyes. Now, that's known to occur with other common respiratory viruses like influenza, viruses that cause the common cold, uh, and enteric viruses which cause diarrhea by putting the, your hands to your mouth. You can easily transmit it. Uh, the question really was, how, what's the relative possibility of how important are surface touching uh, versus uh, inhalation. Um, a, a paper uh, recently written by some authors from the Centers for Disease Control at Emory University in Atlanta suggests that surfaces may be important in crowded situations like daycare centers, uh, schools, and office buildings where there's a lot of common 
touching of surfaces all the time in these types of environments and that. And really viruses can spread very readily just on surfaces in these types of environments. We've done studies where we put viruses on the push plates to enter a building, uh, a tracer virus that doesn't infect people. And we found that within uh, four hours, the virus is on 50% of the commonly touched surfaces, half of the people's hands in that building. So virus, even though it may not even be spread primarily by sneezing and coughing, can be transmitted very right. And it ends up on, on people who, who hands and desks that have never met before, uh, because we've learned basically that a good place to explain a, a trade, actually, germs and gossip is the break room in office buildings, in hospitals and healthcare, because people tend to go in those areas, they're touching common surfaces like tabletops and that contaminating them, and the next person uh, picks it up on their hands. You know, and un unfortunately, uh, the, the, these areas are not often disinfected as regularly as you say the restroom or other areas. So that's something we've learned over the years. Uh, how readily, and it also goes for healthcare uh, institutions where break rooms play a role and viruses can spread very rapidly on surfaces and, and on your hands without you really realizing, you know, even we were surprised how readily mobile phones can move viruses around. They make not only, uh, they make germs more mobile. There's actually been outbreaks from uh, MRSA, the bacteria that causes skin infections related to cell phones. Uh, uh, because the virus can, so you can you can put a virus on a cell phone and then bring it home, and then take it off and place it on some of their surfaces and be affected. So we're really in a germ mobile uh, world today, uh, for that reason. So germs like SARS-CoV-2 have many more opportunities to move around. I, I think it's important to recognize the importance of these surfaces too. You know, we've done studies where we put uh, coronaviruses that cause the common cold very closely. <laughs> Of course, I said cold and I sneeze, but uh, it must be a reaction I had here. Uh, and, and we found that you can uh, actually, by touching a porcelain surface, you can pick up 50% of the coronaviruses on your fingers, 20% on other surfaces. And that's so the it, viruses like uh, coronaviruses can readily get on your hands by touching surfaces uh, all the time. So that's just something we're beginning to realize too. We're putting the puzzle together of how this virus can spread in, in, in different environments. And the importance of surfaces may be more important in some environments than other environments in the spread of the coronaviruses. Yeah, you're talking about sneezing and you mentioned about aerosols and, and uh, contamination of surfaces in highly crowded rooms. Uh, so uh, I guess over a certain period of time, those aerosols will eventually settle down and, and land on surfaces. And in a previous discussion that we had, you mentioned about the re-aerosolization process. You know, Can that's you what tell I us a bit more. Yeah, that's one of the concerns. I know our Centers for Disease Control is going to be doing studies on that, too, because when you sneeze or cough and a virus settles on a surface, uh, it can be re-aerosolized and go back into the air and it could be inhaled. Uh, for example, for a, desk, a desktop, you could just wave your hand or walking across a rug that's contaminated. But we actually did studies in the laboratory where we put a uh, a bacterial virus and influenza in a couch, for example, and we had people sit on it and it caused a great aerosol that people became coated with viruses and it traveled more than three feet away. You have to, I think you haven't recognized uh, in the past that soft surfaces can result in like a microbial whoopee cushion. You sit on it and you get a great aerosolization. I think that's until this uh, uh, pandemic, I think that's an area that's been overlooked. So really just because the a virus settles on a surface does not mean it can't go back into the air and then be inhaled. So I think that's one of the things that we need to pay more attention to and recognize uh, that potential route of transmission. Yeah, it's interesting because the surface cleaning was not something we, we focused on during our, our last discussion last year at ISSA, but obviously with the re aerosolization factor you just spoke about, surface cleaning might be an important factor as it relates to minimizing the spread of the Delta variant, for example. So can, can you tell us a little bit more about the steps that we can all take to ensure proper cleaning of surfaces? 
Yeah, I think it's really important for uh, cleaning a surface to recognize that if you're going to use a disinfectant, you first must clean that surface and then apply a disinfectant in the spray. And I think it's important how you apply that makes a big difference we've seen in reducing the microbial load of surfaces. For example, if you're using a, a, a cleaning tool over and over again, like a, a, a sponge or a cloth material, they're not as effective as spraying a surface and using a paper towel or a disinfecting wipe we found in our studies in homes. The reason why a lot of common disinfectants like bleach or, or quaternary ammonium compounds, which is a commonly used one in the household, will, will absorb to those surfaces or react or be neutralized by those surfaces. Uh, I think is one big concern. The other concern is bacteria will grow in uh, dishcloths and rags. Uh, I mean, usually for that reason, you find more fecal bacteria in the kitchen cleaning tools than you do in the bathroom area because they grow. There's lots of food, they're wet, they're moist, and they grow over time. And so that's why it becomes really important to try to, in areas that are critical, I think most critical, the kitchen area and the bathroom area is where paper towels play a r real role because you don't want to move the germs around uh, bacteria and viruses in the cleaning tools. I, we've always found that cleaning tools, reusable cleaning tools, particularly if not maintained regularly, uh, bacteria will grow to large numbers. Even in a common sponge, uh, you will have millions of fecal bacteria in a sponge if you uh, don't disinfect it in some way within three to four days, because they just go. I mean, if I was a bacteria, if, if I uh, died and want to come back into heaven, I'd make that life a sponge, because there's plenty to eat. It's wet, moist, plenty of companion uh, going on all the time in a sponge in the dish grows. That's why uh, it's really important uh, to look at that. And we've looked at homes that use paper towels and disinfecting wipes. And we find uh, if you look on the surfaces in the kitchen area, you have 99 percent fewer bacteria on those surfaces because you're not continually moving and spreading around if you keep reusing the clean tools. And that's even homes that use disinfectants, too. The other problem people don't do is allow that disinfectant to act long enough. You know, it takes anywhere from 30 seconds, 30 seconds to 10 minutes. So you got to be aware of that. In some ways, that's why disinfecting wipes work well, because we've learned that people will use them and just let the surface dry. So you have plenty of time for that disinfecting wipe to, to act all the time. I think the and, same thing. Go ahead. You, 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 mentioned, you mentioned about cleaning first, right? And, and I think it relates to also how the disinfectant can act on the germs, right? Right, that, right. you have to apply that disinfectant and allow it sit there for a while. Uh, even bleach, it still takes 30 seconds for it to kill the, the germs. So that waiting time is important. So I can emphasize the importance of cleaning tools not only at the home, but uh, even in, in restaurants. We've done studies on restaurant tables where we'll ask the waiter or waitress to come over and wipe a surface. And usually lay, lay down a thin layer of E. coli for us to eat with, with those because even though they're supposed to use disinfectants on these that they use, it's still not enough to kill the organisms. And because the disinfectants get tied up in these cleaning cloths, uh, they're not as effective. Uh, you have to realize that too, how important cleaning tools are all the time. In really critical areas, that's why paper towels, I, I think, uh, be, become so important in that, in the cleaning and then disposal of the uh, bacteria and viruses. And certainly we've learned that in homes and in public facilities. Uh, where it becomes really important in ensuring that you're not actually making things worse. Uh, that's happened a lot with cleaning tools. We studied norovirus outbreaks where they came in and used cloths and uh, a bleach, and they ended up spreading the virus. It got more contamination in the facility, even from 30% uh, to 60% of the surfaces contaminated. Uh, so it's really critical to always pay attention to uh, cleaning tools, particularly if you're cleaning up any type of spill where somebody might have been ill. Mm -hmm. So disinfecting is is a good idea as long as it's properly uh, executed, right? right. Um, and given that you're a, an educator, uh, I'm sure there has been much dialogue at your university and others across the country uh, as to how best product students as well as staff from COVID-19 uh, and, and most recently the Delta variant. So 
Can you tell us how the uh, education sector has adjusted to the pandemic? Yes, it really, really uh, took a rethinking of how we um, practice uh, hygiene and what tools we can make available to people using public facilities. My university went to automatic paper towel dispensers for, for every restroom. They decided why uh, why not take it, why take a chance really of using your hand to open the uh, I mean dispense the paper towels and that that was one of the big initiatives uh, that they did uh, and, and made it a lot more available and then of course more regular disinfecting uh, of cleaning of the restrooms and of the classrooms the classrooms can be a real challenge because the germiest spot we usually find are the desktops. So it makes it more difficult to wipe every desktop with a disinfectant. So they went to uh, spray disinfectants, uh, you know, aerosolization of the disinfectants. Electrostatic sprayers can be used for that because one person can cover a larger area. And I think that becomes more important in the classroom area. I think you get a lot of coverage and you reduce your risk. Uh, one of the things, though, we found in our studies, you, you do even a better job if you wipe those surfaces after you've done electrostatic spraying, because uh, you get more reduction of the uh, bacteria and viruses. Why is that? Because electrostatic sprayers make droplets on surfaces. So there's a little space between each droplet. And if you don't wipe that surface, uh, you, you, uh, you won't have as great a reduction. Now, electrostatic sprayers, I think, are good because um, they cover a large area. They wouldn't be normally disinfected easily by one person. But if you want to enhance that even more, and, that, and I know it requires more time, but may be useful in a critical and high touch areas, is to wipe those high touch areas, like a doorknob, for example, or certain communal uh, tabletops. When you're done electrostatic spraying, wipe those areas. You'll be even more effective uh, in, in your coverage of, uh, with the uh, disinfectants in that. That was one of the things we, we actually learned. Um, in, in a I, mean, I think the other thing, too, that we've done, too, is make sure there's adequate numbers of paper towels available, too, in some uh, other public places where they didn't have them as readily available. So that's made a big difference, I, I think, and it encourages people uh, to clean up after, just like we saw in that video. Um, I, I was impressed with the video is that the person wiped the uh, countertop, because we've done in studies where we've put viruses on people's hands and bacteria, had them put an autom under an automatic uh, faucet and it just bounces the bacteria and viruses right off their hands and contaminates the countertop. Actually, you get more countertop contamination with an automatic uh, water dispenser for your, uh, than you do with a, a, a faucet you have to turn because the water pressure is higher. So, you know, I, I was impressed with that because that seems to be an area of high contamination actually. And a um, few times you mentioned about using paper towels. Can, can you tell us really the basics of why paper towels are better for hand drying? Uh, for in other words, one, you get more friction on your hands. Uh, you get the absorbent of the liquid off your hands. I think those are the two critical things we've seen. It, it absorbs more liquid. It absorbs the liquid, I should say, uh, and the friction to, of getting it off. I think it's the last final step. One of the things with one of the issues we have with hand blow dryers a lot of the time uh, is people don't say they're long enough uh, that you'd like to see them. And, and you have the potential, of course, of re-aerosolization if anything's on your hands. But I, I think people tend to finish off drying their hands on their hips, by the way. Uh, actually, if you want to know, the germiest part of your clothing is your hips, by the way, because your hands are there all the time. Uh, and I think, too, a lot of people will avoid washing their hands because a hand blow dryer, they just don't want to spend that much time in the restroom, I, I think, is one of the issues that uh, that we tend to deal with a lot of times uh, with it. Um, and at least in our studies, I think it's really important, that the drying of your hands, because we've seen that um, when we've done surveys in public facilities, only in only about 70% of the people before COVID-19 uh, washed their hands. But I think more importantly, only 50% of them actually used soap, which really surprised us. And then only washed their hands for about 11 seconds rather than the 20 seconds that's been recommended by uh, our Centers for Disease Control. So I think that made a difference. So hand drying becomes more important. 
I think, for that reason, because it adds an extra step. If you didn't use soap and you didn't wash for the 20 seconds, uh, I think it becomes a little bit more critical than most people might think, because not everybody is uh, doing what we consider optimal hand washing like you saw in, in the video. And can you, can you remind us why the 20 seconds is so important? Well, the 20 seconds was shown that it was important to reduce the number of bacteria on your hands by over 90 percent. And that's why they got the 20 second time uh, in there, why it's so important that you actually wash your hands for that long. And you followed the procedure. That person did a very good job. He managed to get his uh, fingers and fingernails into his palm because you have to realize that's another location that uh, germs can hide. Mm -hmm. Um as you know, we're all familiar with the term fake news, and I think that applies to the things uh, that, that we've heard and the misconceptions uh, surrounding hygiene and cleaning during the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think one of the problems, in some ways, you always look at the access to information we have now is greater than any generation in history. We have phones and videos and that. And I think anybody can put any kind of belief they want onto a phone or interpretation of events, either to avoid events or modify events. And I think it's really important uh, that people pay attention to studies that have been done, scientific studies that have been done and published. I know in being a scientist, my role is always looking at what's been published in the science literature, been reviewed by our, our other people involved in the field. It also allows an assessment of the details what's been done in that. And we've learned a lot uh, with SARS-CoV-2. We know masks work. There have been several studies that show masks reduce your probability. A study done uh, here in uh, Tucson, Arizona, among schools, if schools require mask wearing in the schools, you, you reduce the probability of, of an outbreak by th threefold in that school. So we know they work. The same thing with hand washing. We, we know it works. It reduces, I mean, many, many, many studies, more than I can recall, reduces uh, the uh, your probability of getting ill by hand washing. You know, one of the things I should mention, too, is with the hand washing too, is, is the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is, is very susceptible to inactivation by detergent. So you may get some additional effect with the hand detergent uh, that you have uh, available too. And it's a very susceptible to common disinfectants. It's one of the wimpiest viruses that we've ever studied. So it's pretty much any disinfectant you're likely to use if you use it properly or, or soap or detergent, you will greatly reduce your risk of, of getting uh, the, the virus. Excellent. And, um, we have noticed a lot of changes taking place uh, in, in public spaces to ensure proper hygiene and sanitization, such as uh, food operated door handles and scanning QR codes to check on the sanitization of restaurants, for example. What are the types of innovations have you seen? In, in, Maybe what, in your opinion, is still missing? Yeah, we've seen a number of innovations. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of work ourselves on disinfectants, which are called continuously acting disinfectants, uh, which will actually leave uh, the surface uh, capable of still killing uh, viruses and bacteria uh, that are available. Uh, well, I mean, there have been antimicrobial surfaces before. They've largely been designed to protect the material and claims were, were limited by regulatory agencies. But what we have now are products that can leave uh, a residual on a surface that can act up to at least 24 hours. Those claims are allowed in the United States uh, saying it lasts 24 hours. Now, regulatory people still haven't allowed in the United States making claims against viruses and SARS-CoV-2 for 24 hours. Uh, but we certainly have seen um, these products capable of killing the SARS virus even after 24 or 48 hours. And I think that's a big innovation that uh, hopefully eventually the regulatory agencies come in to recognize the potential of it. The concern with the regulatory agencies has been largely that people will, will disinfect and clean less. But we see this as an additional barrier be between regular cleaning and disinfectant. And I think that's one of the bigger innovations that we've seen coming out of the uh, pandemic is this continuous, 
the acting disinfectants and the barriers that we see in hopefully in the future. There have been a number of products like uh, organosiline clots that seem very effective and copper uh, surfaces and paints that seem to be very effective against SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses. And I think it's just a matter of further demonstration of the utility of these surfaces and, and their potential uh, benefits. Uh, I, think. I think the other thing too is uh, the uh, uh, the increased hygiene awareness of the general public that we've seen and acceptance uh, by the majority of people of its importance. You know, the other thing that we've seen uh, is these in enhanced hygiene efforts dramatically decreased other infections like influenza and, and, and viral diarrhea has decreased dramatically in the last two years and in flu season. Uh, it's amazing. And what, but it, it was added proof that these hygiene interventions do work against all common diseases. And we should be aware of that. The data that is being gathered indicates that it can find benefit. And of course, one of my hopes too is the, uh, the emphasis on it of the younger generation, particularly school children uh, and, and younger people, that this will leave an impact that will last the rest of their life of the importance of hygiene. And I'm sure it will because young, particularly school children are an impressible age and they, they can utilize this information in the future. So I think we're going to change hygiene habits altogether. Uh, and I think what we've seen too is people are going to ask when they go to work in a facility, what are you doing uh, to protect me from infectious diseases, to reduce the probability of me getting an infectious diseases or schools? I think uh, parents, the next generation of parents will ask, what are you doing to protect my kids? How, what's the cleaning and hygiene procedures that you have in place? So I think the impact of this pandemic will last this next generation. I think uh, because of it in, in the what's happened to the interruption of schools and activities, they're going to become much more aware and be much more demanding uh, of, of proper hygiene procedures. They're going to know what are you doing? Uh, what is the impact of this? Uh, how does this impact me? And what are the simple solutions? Really what we're talking a lot about are simple solutions and some innovations that have come along. We've also seen attempts to maybe disinfect the air on a regular basis too, to reduce the probability of uh, getting in contact with viral aerosols. Some of them look promising, but we need more studies in that on those. We're hoping maybe we'd have devices that can continually disinfect the air that uh, where human beings could still be in the same facility and that we see innovation coming along. A lot of those will, will take additional research and acceptance by regulatory agencies, but it's kind of an exciting time now where we're getting able to create greater awareness, but redefining hygiene and, and measuring its impact quantitatively. Um, it's really impressive to see how much reduction in, in uh, common illnesses that we have has occurred during this pandemic. And hopefully we'll find those options uh, that work the best and we get the best cost benefits for those options in the future. Because we're going to be able to have the data now in sufficient quantity uh, we never had before to do those things. That's an important point you're raising there. Uh, the uh, Well, it's been said that we're kind of uh, building the aircraft as the flight has already started. And that's uh, for a scientist like you, I think it's an also an exciting time uh, where there's such a focus on a global problem like this one. Um, uh, I think the uh, uh, research that uh, you're, you're doing now is uh, exactly at the center of the, uh, uh, the topic that we're trying to cover and it's how to protect the, the society. Uh, and, and another aspect, you have scientifically demonstrated that, for example, shopping carts are very contaminated. Mm -hmm. and, and the use of wipes to disinfect is an interesting solution. Uh, and there's also other scientific papers that are coming along, and they indicate that other surfaces in the supermarket, such as all the fresh fruits and, and vegetables, are exposed on the shelf, and they are frequently manipulated by customers. For example, they touch to see if they're ripe, and they finally replace the item on the shelf for the next customers. So what is your opinion on this? And is there a preventive solution? Yeah, you know, it's always recommended that any uh, 
fresh fruit or vegetable you're going to eat raw, you always wash it all the time, at least. Uh, or uh, particularly if you're immunocompromised or older individual, you probably should use a disinfectant uh, on it, like soak it uh, in a bleach uh, solution, you know, add a tablespoon for a liter of water or a quart of water, uh, and, and wash it uh, with the bleach, because that will further reduce the number of microorganisms and bacteria. You have to remember, a lot of people may have handled that not only in the store, but during harvesting, even though a lot of precautions are taken today for that. Uh, but you should always be aware of when you're handling uh, any kind of fresh fruits and vegetables. The other thing is, you mentioned shopping carts, but in our more recent studies, we, we got interested in, in self-checkout counters because they're becoming very popular now, particularly even in supermarkets and grocery stores where you check out on your own. And we've sampled the surfaces of the screens and buttons you're touching to do that. And they get fairly heavily contaminated. I mean, we found um, bacteria that uh, like MRS say methicillin re resistant staph aureus, which causes skin infections, C. difficile, which causes diarrhea on these surfaces. Because remember, large numbers of people are touching these surfaces all the time, different people. Uh, you have to remember, we're the touch generation, I always say. You're going to touch more surfaces that more people have touched in one day than any generation in history. Think about it. We went to the store in town. 120 years ago, you were likely a farmer and you went into town once a week. Now you're going to the grocery store every couple of day and touching surfaces, which hundreds of people uh, have touched. And these checkout counter things really get contaminated. They really should provide, I think, disinfecting wipes at these self-checkout counters or pet towels to really clean these surfaces because because of the large number of people. I mean, they're becoming so popular, I usually wait in line to get to use them now, even though they may have a large number of them. Uh, but, but you have to recognize the potential high use. You know, the same thing with uh, any kind of button surface you touch. You may not be aware, we've done studies in elevator buttons, but the first floor elevator button is always the most contaminated because everybody's got to touch it to get out of the building uh, all the time. The others are touched less frequently. So that's the, the button that's always touched more than any other. Uh, the other th any interesting button, like a lot of um, when you're uh, taking money out of the banking machines, it's the enter button or the enter button on, on the gas pumps that you might press in that. So it's the common buttons, interestingly enough, uh, where you find most of the germs, those are very basically uh, germ transfer sites all the time. And I know that's a, they do have uh, alcohol gel sanitizers at gasoline pumps because they get fairly contaminated, actually. Uh, so think about it, what are your high touch areas uh, all the time? Because uh, those are areas of, of germ transfer areas, as I always look at them all the time. You don't always find a lot of germs on them because they're coming off and on, off and on. 50% is coming off and people are putting 50% back on. So they're, they're uh, very high active areas in that. But I think there's still room for some interven interventions that we haven't recognized, particularly as society changes like self-checkout, uh, that we have to be aware of. We're creating uh, increasing opportunities for germ transfer. Yeah, and that's another proof uh, uh, of the efficiency of hands as being good carriers for germs. Um, well, the last time we spoke, you also highlighted some not so obvious places and surfaces that can be highly contaminated. And I seem to remember you mentioning something about how filthy those break room couches are. And we all sit on them and we never think twice about it. Um, are there any other places or surfaces that we should be aware of when it comes to hygiene? You know, there are key areas. You know, when we look at it, um, we like to do what we call germ geography. Where are all the germs where I'm going to be at that I'm going to share with other people? Because it's really about sharing germs all the time. You mentioned couches. I, I think that's an area where we need to look at more. We study outbreaks of uh, MRSA infections among firemen and it was traced to the couches, the cloth couches, when they removed those and put uh, vinyl couches in, they limit, the outbreak stopped. So I think there, that was one of the evidence that that plays a role in any type of soft surfaces. I think that when it comes to hygiene, there needs to be improvement in that area. But other areas you, you might not uh, think of is uh, like high touch areas. Let's go to your car. Cars we study 
in automobiles, the germiest spot in the car is the dashboard, then the cup holder, and then the steering wheel. And the, the more people that use the same car, the more germs that you have them. If you're taking kids uh, to a soccer game, where you're going to contaminate the car. And it's amazing how many germs you find in the car. When's the last time you cleaned and disinfected the car? In any place there's spills in a car, you get more bacteria and viruses. That's another good place to keep paper towels for school. The bacteria really build up. And if you're living, interesting enough, I can almost tell where a car comes from. Because if you're in uh, if you're in the southern U.S. like Florida, it looks like a sauna microbiology. And if you're in Montreal, it looks like a refrigerator to me. But anytime you spill something in a car, it allows the bacteria to grow if you don't really get to disinfect it. I think that's something to be aware of. Um, same thing, what's an area, if you take uh, mass transit, where are you going to find it? It's the handle if you're getting on a bus, people touch to get into the, uh, into the, uh, the bus. If you're going in an in airplane, your tray is the most germ-laden area. Because why? That's where your hands are all the time. It's amazing. In testing airplanes, we found influenza and norovirus, which caused diarrhea on, the, on the, uh, the actual tray handle that you actually are looking at. Uh, so you, you start realizing there's certain areas where you're going to find the uh, viruses more often, bacteria uh, on these high-touch areas. Um, do you have any other areas of interest that you were worried about? I, we've done a lot of uh, germ geography, if you call it, and it really depends on the environment you're in. Actually, uh, one thing that might be of interest is who has the germiest office? Uh, and it's uh, school teachers. Uh, uh, never go into a teacher's office. They have the most germ-laden uh, offices of anything we've seen. Uh, and, and next is, uh, in terms of their desk, are, are lawyers, I mean, sorry, bankers and accountants, because I guess they're doing money laundering or something. I don't know what's going on in there. Uh, the, the, the least germy profession, you're, you're going to be amazed, is a race between lawyers and physicians. They have the, the, the least, lawyers are always out playing golf with the other lawyers. I think I'm not quite sure why, but that's one of the things we noticed in, in a lot of our, our testing of germ offices. And we do know if people practice good hygiene in offices, like use disinfectants, you reduce the number uh, of bacteria and viruses on surfaces by, by, by uh, more than 50%. Uh, so just those common practices we've learned make a big difference. Actually, another area is phones. Now, you, you, like cell phones, even a phones uh, uh, in an office building that are, are not mobile, they get really bad because everybody puts their mouth on it all the time. Now, mobile phones get bad, too. And you think, well, it's just me, but you're touching the surfaces and then putting your fingers on it. And you're putting germs on a mobile phone, like I say, and you're moving them around on that phone. And there have been outbreaks from phones before for that reason. That's why the surfaces in your environment count so much uh, that you're, you're, you're testing all the time and that you're looking at. Um, I think in uh, schools we've tested, uh, which might be of interest, uh, and usually uh, the difference between kindergarten and uh, fifth grade are no like they're really germy areas. Somebody asked me what's the area you're most fair to go to and catching something that that would be a daycare center or the first grade or kindergarten. Most germy. And then in the fifth grade, it changes because suddenly we, we're guessing people reach puberty and mucus running out your nose is not uh, it's kept it anymore with your co-students uh, in that. And classrooms tend to clean up after the previous areas in the school are the children's desktops, cafeteria tables, uh, and the pencil sharpener, uh, if there's one in the room, and computer equipment. Those are the four most German-laden areas in schools we've tested. Uh, when they get actually to uh, high school and they have lockers, lockers in inside tend to get contaminated a lot during the school year because nobody cleans the lock. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry for the technical issues I had. And we just got a, a very good question from the audience. I'll, I'll read it through. And how do we know decreased incidence rate of infections other than from SARS-CoV-2 is due to enhanced hygiene versus social distancing and masking? You know, that's a really good question. It's a real challenge.
for doing that because there's not an easy measure without doing large epidemiological studies, which are very costly. It costs can cost a million dollars. But what's come in to help us get with that is the going in and measuring the types of germs in a, a building. We've done it in office buildings, for example, or how they spread. And then using uh, risk analysis, we know how many surfaces people are likely touch in a day and how many times they touch in their face. And we can determine by a reduction in the number of bacteria or viruses we detect, what's your reduction in probability of getting ill. For example, we did a study where we did disinfecting wipes uh, and gave hand sanitizers to an office building uh, in, in Arizona. And we thought we decreased the risk of anybody getting uh, a influenza infection with 88%. The simple hygiene can be measured like that uh, using really uh, measuring the exposure. We can estimate the number of people that get ill, and then we can do an intervention and estimate the people of reduction. And we've done this in daycare center, I mean, I'm sorry, in hospitals, in hotels and that, and we can measure the amount of uh, exposure to people who get of different viruses and estimate the impact of that intervention. Because it's very difficult to measure. A lot's been used too as ATP measures, which measure really organic load. And we've been able to show that if you can reduce the number of ATP, you can reduce the spread of, uh, of viruses in a facility too. So that's a rough measure of uh, cleanliness, which seems to be related to exposure to virus spread in buildings that we've done before. It's a real challenge to measure the impact uh, of these interventions, but we're working on that and trying it because I think it's important that we give numbers to this. Why is it so important? Okay, we reduce the number of infections by 88%. And, but we, we realize that only costs a dollar a year per person in that building. But we can do cost benefits now. And one of the things we're involved in is doing cost benefits uh, in, in reducing of common diseases. Because it, it can be really important. It's also important not only with absenteeism of employees or students, but presenteeism, where you go to work and you don't feel well. That costs a company as much, if not more. Because most people, adults, will only miss maybe three or four days a year from illness, but they'll go to work maybe three or four weeks not feeling well, so they're less productive. You're not as, as productive if you have a headache or you're sneezing and coughing. So people shouldn't underestimate the cost benefit of it, really simple hygiene and putting products in the right places and making them available to employees and a reduction in the spread of viruses. We've seen it in our studies, very effective uh, in reducing the spread of these uh, viruses and bacteria in facilities. In talking about viruses and bacteria, we, we hear a lot about uh, superbugs that are resistant to antibiotics and uh, we feel it's becoming a serious problem. Can you explain us briefly what is this issue? Yeah, the, the concern is with uh, resistance to antibiotic uh, uh, resistant bacteria and not being able to use antibiotics in hospitals and not being able to treat people with certain infections like methicillin resistant Staph aureus or C. difficile in the hospitals. It's particularly a problem in hospitals and a lot of concern. Uh, there was uh, a lot of focus on this before the SARS outbreak because we're realizing the number of people who are becoming ill from antibiotic resistant bacteria in deaths that we see is increasing. It, some people have uh, speculated that uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, it'll be the second cause of death in developed countries. Uh, uh, it will surpass cancer because we, we treat cancer and other diseases by immunosuppressing people, which gives greater opportunity for these antibiotic resistant bacteria to take over. So that's become a concern. I mean, w w that will come back as a concern, I think, uh, more and more uh, because uh, it really demonstrates uh, what the persistence we knew. We know interventions with increased hand hygiene uh, and, and using disinfectants will reduce the spread of these bacteria in, in healthcare environments. But we also see these uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria spreading in, in, outside of hospitals too, particularly MRSA. Uh, so and we have to worry about that. If you ever seen anybody with a skin infection with that, uh, it's very worrisome and you can die from that. C. difficile can infect people outside the hospital too. So we're seeing these antibiotic bacteria spread into the a general environment and into the community and that. So we really have to worry about them. And hygiene, it's been shown in hospitals, is our 
a good defense and our first defense against these antibiotic resistant bacteria. But we'll become more and more concerned with them in, in, in the future in ways of controlling them. And I think we'll see more and more attempts like we saw in, in the fire stations to try to control the spread of these infections like MRSA by using good hygiene and maybe um, recharacterizing our indoor environment. Like what's the best type of indoor environment? Should we be using vinyl surfaces rather than cloth surfaces in critical environments? And if we use cloth surfaces, we need innovation in how we clean and disinfect these surfaces on a, a regular basis because they really accumulate uh, microorganisms very readily in that. I mean, because especially when people eat on a couch, I mean, you're creating a cafeteria for uh, bacteria in, in your couch. Ooh, and, um, the antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, they're not, as I hear, they're not getting resistant to disinfectant though. Right. That's one of the things. I'm glad you brought, reminded me of that. Uh, yeah, they don't become resistant to disinfectant. That term is used a lot inappropriately in the scientific literature, I think. They become a little bit more tolerant to the uh, disinfectant. It may take a little bit longer concentration or a longer dose to actually kill the microorganisms. But the common doses, uh, I mean, concentrations that we use today are more than effective in, in killing these. So we shouldn't really realize that a lot of people have said they're, they're more disinfected. But I want to point out chlorine bleach has been used for more than 120 years and common um, uh, quaternary ammonia compounds have been used in more than the 70s and no organism has developed a resistance from exposure to these organisms. Common doses that are com used uh, in cleaning and disinfectant are still adequate. Great. Uh, we have another good question from the audience. Do you have any thoughts on the use of UVC light and far UVC light to help with disinfection? Yeah, they're very effective on surfaces, UV light. Uh, I think they're an option. There's some innovation with uh, 220, 220 nanometer light, maybe it work because you can use that when people in, are in the room. I think with UV light, it's important you understand if you're using a device that you, you, you give the proper exposure the right amount of time with the UV light, I think is one of the tricks with that. Uh, and then how well it works uh, on various types of surfaces may be an issue too. Now in the hospital arena, they have these UV robots they put in a room, people leave the room and they may give it anywhere from a five to 30 minute exposure. Uh, and that significantly reduces the uh, amount of bacteria and viruses that may be in the room with using those, but they can't be used, I think, in general facilities very easily because people must leave the room, uh, which is possible in a patient room. But the rooms must be cleaned first because otherwise it's difficult to reduce uh, the amount of the bacteria and virus if they're in dirt. Uh, for example, can it shade them too? But but UV light can be used. There are limitations with UV light, and I think it really takes proper training of individuals to use them properly. Given your, your breadth of expertise, what, what can you tell us about the future of hygiene? Well, I think the future of hygiene is here to stay. Like I said in the beginning, this next generation is very sensitized to it. Uh, and they're going to be more demanding, I think, in the facilities that they occupy. What is being done to protect me? What type of intervention is there going to be? And I think they'll be more sensitive to the evolution of newer uh, um, bacteria and viruses in our community. They're going to be paying more attention, I think, and more demanding. And I think, really, the, the industry needs to respond to that. They need to give simple options. The public needs to be educated. What's the best? way to protect myself. What should I ask an employee? What's my checklist of things to make sure they're doing that are available to me and what they're doing that I'm, I may not be directly aware of? They, they need to be confidence building and hygiene. We need to see hygiene confidence building in any facility, uh, I think. And this is going to require more training and awareness of facilities managers and of the people who do this. We need to elevate them, hopefully, to the importance they've been finding really Proper facility managers and proper cleaning will save, more, will prevent more illness and save more lives than any physician. And I think they're really underappreciated. Dad, just go home and think about it today. How many lives did I save in that school? How many people are less ill because of that? You will do that. You will end up doing that to more people than any physician will do in their whole career just in a year or two. And you should be patted on the back for that. 
Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gerber. We're running out of time, and I really appreciate uh, the time you've taken to educate us on, on the importance of hygiene. So thank you very much for, uh, for sharing with us today. Thank you. Uh, and, and for more information about Cascades Pro, please visit our website, cascadespro.com, and please stay tuned for a short video on our Tandem Dispenser collection. Thanks, everyone.